Color is my day-long obsession, joy, and torment. Claude Monet This is The Artful Painter, art lessons for artists, collectors, and people who love art. Cami Mendeley's exquisite landscape paintings shimmer and vibrate with animated light and color. Her lifelong journey of curiosity and deep observation of the natural world began when she was a young child. The Minnesota farmland she grew up on was fertile, not just for crops, but also for a young mind curious about the wonders of the land that was her home. She was entranced by the beauty of the rhythm and harmony of nature and its myriads of colors. Cammie thinks of herself as a lifelong student. Each seeming advance of knowledge leads to more questions and a never-ending quest to answer them in her paintings. Her passion is the study of color. However, she does not keep what she learns to herself. Over the years, she has taught well over 1,000 students a process to help achieve the illusion of light and vibration in their paintings. Over 10 years in the making, she has codified the lessons she has learned about color in a new book titled Color Relativity, Creating the Illusion of Light with Paint. This gorgeous new book is due to be released towards the end of the summer of 2022. In this episode, Cammie reveals that she has struggled with dyslexia. However, the challenge of dyslexia did not prevent her from developing a deep love of books and the writing of color relativity. She opens up about what is involved in creating, editing, and publishing a quality art book. If you were to observe Cammie Menlik painting outdoors or in her studio, just as she begins to make her colors dance, you might just see a smile flicker upon her face, a slight inhale of a calming breath, and then, with quiet abandon, see her surrender to the process. My name is Carl Olson, and this is The Artful Painter. Cammy, there's a there's a scene in a movie that I saw not too long ago, just a clip, but it was so poignant. It's a movie about Vermeer. It's called Girl with a Pearl uh, Earring. And mm -hmm. there's this scene where he throws open the door or the window and asks his model, who I believe is played by Scarlett Johansson, and he mm -hmm. asked her what he said, look at the clouds. What color are they? Now, of course, the model, the first thing she said was, they're white. But then she stopped, paused, looked, and then you could hear her slow response. She said, yellow, blue, and gray. They are the colors of the clouds. And of course, Vermeer in the movie, the way they depict him, he smiles knowingly, says, you get it. You Now you understand. I want to know that moment when you began to understand the depths of color. Oh, I love this. I have, goose, I have goosebumps. Um, well, it's so interesting because I don't know if there was a moment that I understood because I still don't know if I understand. <laughs> but I remember, I do remember a moment where I saw, and I was young, I was a child. I mean, a little girl walking <laughs> across the field I actually start my book out like this is walking across the field to my grandma's house. And I remember seeing like what I felt like now I would describe as vibration of color, but I didn't just see one solid color. I saw bounces of colors, like little dots of different colors. And I saw pinks and I saw purples and I saw like different colors. And I remember that, like, I just remember so vividly, you know, like thinking like, huh, I wonder, I wonder how I would paint that. But I really didn't even paint. I drew since I could hold anything. Um, so yeah, so it's been, it's been interesting, but 
the thing about that observation as a child, and I think that we're born with these things, these talents or a talent, meaning the God given, whatever the thing we were born with, you know, not what we do with it, but is that then the world teaches you that you're wrong. <laughs> so are we brave enough to come back to our truth, <laughs> our original truth? That's a good way to, to look at it. I, I mean, I didn't have the curiosity of color that you did as a child. I was more geeky and that sort of thing. But uh, we do learn these symbologies, don't we? Right. They're, they're symbols of things. And uh, I guess that, that can be a, a real challenge to overcome. There are other things I remember um, that I didn't realize until maybe I was studying with someone in my 20s or something. But I remember that I saw shapes, but I didn't know even the word shape. I mean, that I, I didn't think of abstraction or shape or anything like that. But I do have memories laying just in the field and looking at the shape of the sky going into the trees, the tree lines, but I didn't see, I didn't necessarily see the shape of the tree line, but I saw the shape, I saw the sky as a shape. So I think that made it easier for me to see it as a color because I wasn't just thinking about that's a sky. I was naturally seeing shapes of color, but I wouldn't have had a clue how to articulate that or understand any of that. So it's kind of like learning a language. I, my brother, my brother just, he just became a grandfather. And I told him that's mm -hmm. going to be the happiest feeling in the world being a grandfather, but I digress. Yeah. Okay. Oh, but yes. he, he, he sent me a picture of the baby, a little video of the baby mm -hmm. and his eyes are wide open. So the baby at that point has no language to describe what it sees. Right. Right. And right. isn't that it, the way it, I, it sounds like that's what you're talking. It's almost like you're learning a new language for the first time. It's such, I mean, if you think, if I think about the symbolisms in, or the communication in our senses, just naturally, you know, for lack of better terms, the caveman symbol, you know, like, like we're just like senses, you know, our senses um, and sight is definitely one and scent and taste and, you know, all these things that I think we maybe don't consciously think of, we just subconsciously use them all the time. But I think, uh, and I think that they're put in place in the human to, to communicate. I mean, to survive. And I find this interesting. Um, it is interesting. Kids, yeah, little kids. So I have a water cooler in my, I've always had a water cooler in my studios. And there's red and there's blue. And little, little, little kids that never have been taught that red is hot and blue is cold will, before they can barely talk, will say hot to the red. And I just find that interesting because I don't think that they've been taught that at the tiny age, but every kid knows that that's hot and that's blue is cold. <laughs> I find that it just, so that's a, that's a natural intuition. Yeah. So there is a usefulness to symbology. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, that's what the alphabet is. It is a group of symbols and there's, and yeah. they're put together into words and sentences and paragraphs and thoughts and mm -hmm. things like that. In programming, we had symbols. <laughs> In fact, that's right. what they were often called, what... symbols, right? Uh, right. And even letters, I mean, you know, armature shapes, you know, abstraction shapes, all of this comes from nature. I mean, like the, the, the shapes that we're pulling from, like if you think of abstracting, so some people might think that abstraction is like making wild stuff up, but to me abstraction is abstracting from pulling from like you know georgia o'keefe said i'm abstracting from nature i'm yes. not making this up so i'm pulling from and to me you know broken down to the to the the core of that is truth <laughs> so that's just that's where my head is at right now with color and shapes it's like not what needs to be in there, but what doesn't need to be in there. And, 
and simple is not easy thinking like that with my work. I think a lot of us struggle with that. How did how did you come to come to an understanding of that? I mean, I you know, I I visualize myself when I first started learning this stuff and it was like it was bewildering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how did mm -hmm. you how did you start breaking it down so that you you could put meaning behind the abstraction. You could do that abstra abstraction with meaning. I think I, I feel like I'm just <laughs> always just starting. <laughs> I'm always just starting <laughs> to maybe have an idea about where I'm going, but you know, that's that why, whole that's thing. Why that's why it's fun. That's why it's fun. I know, like I'm never gonna get there and that's a good thing because why would I <laughs> show up tomorrow? So when did I start understanding? I, it's so funny because I don't know if I'll ever be able to say I totally understand anything, but start to understand things. I guess maybe start being curious about it more and more. So one of the things that, I mean, I think early on, decades on of being a, an artist person in this life, whether you're honing, on a, honing in on a particular craft or not, I think that like, really, I do love the details and I'm in love with all the beautiful, tiny, little, I, I mean, I used to pick ferns and depict every little tiny, like just detail. And I thought I'd be a botanical artist. So, so it's not that I don't see it. I've trained myself because I understand that there's something more for me than the detail in it. And I, I can tap into a real human experience and emotion from shapes of abstraction. And I feel that it's, it's a hard thing because is it fact? I don't, I don't think so. I think it's truth. And I think that's different than fact. Um, How so? I mean, help me understand that. So fact yeah. versus truth. Well, I think, you know, it's a fact that I'm sitting on a chair and this is the table and this is a computer and, you know, we're definitely having a conversation. And then truth is, I think more of a feeling it's like, it's like, you know, or, or, or a feeling like love or, um, you know, whatever someone's spirituality is like, that's true to you. Um, you know, you can't actually, you know, it's not tangible. You can't say this is love and this is what it's like and you purchase it or it's right here, but you know that it's true. So that's a really, to me, basic example. So there's many nuanced pieces that we assemble into an experience that we we go through of some sort yes i mean so it's not it's not black or white right which right. is so interesting too all these like analogies or metaphors you know you think of you know nothing is black and white and then i think of the value scale like the gray scale between yeah. black and white and nothing in painting is ever just white or black either and there is trillions of nuances in between and those nine point value scales, but you have to organize them. You know, this is going off on a tangent, but just like everything I like, in life. I like is tangents. So. I love tangents, <laughs> except for when there's like a tree and another tree lining up that kind of tangent. I'm not into, but. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what well, kind of tangent we're talking about here. <laughs> well, I'm constantly trying to come up with analogies and they're not always good. In fact, most yeah. of the time they're not, but that is my learning mechanism. Right. I relate one thing to another thing. I say, okay, I'm beginning to see the pieces come together there. But it, it you know, I was thinking, and I, I probably have mentioned this before, but I'm at that age where I can tell the same story again and not get bored. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um. I think of it like I, I, I developed an interest in cooking many years ago. Mm. And so I started while watching Alton Brown. In fact, I, I knew his director of photography and, uh, and one of his, uh, uh, graphic designers and all that. So it was just, it was kind of interesting to get to know that. And Alton Brown taught the principles. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now you began to understand why this recipe works and what you can now do to change that recipe. Whereas before I was an exact, I had to do it exactly the way it was. And there is a reason for that, but yeah. but now beginning to understand, okay, now if this happens with this, mm -hmm. I might get the same result or a similar result here. So it's, 
I like the way he taught. <laughs> uh, and I thought, ooh, that's, that's pretty good. And what does that got to do with art? He was a very artful person. Uh, Alton Brown is just... Well, cooking yeah. is. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> cooking is a form of art. I mean, it, it is art. I mean, uh, I mean it can be. <laughs> just like it can be a disaster. Can but... <laughs> <laughs> painting can be. It can be. It doesn't necessarily mean it is. But that's like, I think what you're talking about is foundation and the fundamental yeah. elements. And that's what, you know, again, off on a tangent, but I mean, that's what my whole painting is about is foundation and, and going down to the bones, simple, simple, simple over and over again. And, you know, I, I, I use this analogy when I'm teaching that, you know, painting is like, you know, playing the piano and you've got these colors. And, you know, for me, I have a, a, an expanded limited palette of two yellows, two reds and two blues. And, and, you know, what do you, it's just paint. I mean, it's just yellow and red and blue. So and they're then, the key. They're the keys of the piano. There's the keys of the piano. And, you know, you don't just start taking the, the yellow, red and blue paint and smearing it all over the place. And then you're like, wow, that's a piece of, I mean, maybe it is someone, but you know, it, it doesn't work for me that way. Right. And then, and the same with the piano, um, you know, like when the kids come over, my nieces and nephew, and they used to pound on the piano. I was like, ah. you know, just because they're pounding on the piano doesn't make it art or music. So like the pianist, you know, they begin by learning where the keys are. So I always find it a little humorous in the beginning when someone might have the desire to paint, which I think there's a reason for, but but they're frustrated because they're not making good paintings because they didn't do the foundational fundamental work. And so for me, as a younger painter, I was kind of like a wild horse, you know, which is good because you can't bring the dead one back to life. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like I was like, oh, I just want to paint. And then I got really into hyper detail. So I've had to really train myself and I continue to do that. You know, I just to really, really learn the fundamentals and that's what I teach. And that's why, you know, I think my teaching is such a big part of my art is I have the strong, deep burning desire to share with people, you know, an approach, a strategy, a method based in the fundamentals that they can apply so they can make art. Because I really think that we all have we are authentic. We are born that way, you know, stylized paintings or, or, you know, like paintings that are like other painters or look like something, or you're trying to make it look like something to me is it's, it's too bad, you know, because you are, you have that thing that is so unique, like no one else. And when we're trying to make a painting and, you know, in my opinion, like look like something that we're trying so hard to be authentic or conceptual instead of just being authentic because we've done the fundamental work. I think that's when our, our unique style comes out. <laughs> so I think about, uh, my brother-in-law loves to turn wood, mm -hmm. but you know, the first bowl that he ever turned was, probably a piece of garbage <laughs> he would tell you that <laughs> and sure. but he kept learning from others uh, the principles of turning that wood understanding the properties of the wood and what would make a good design in the wood and i just think of that as you know you just there's a there's a measure of practice you're building up your vocabulary you're building up your skills yeah yeah i mean i've i've got this bookshelves of books but if all I ever did was read the books, right? As much as I love them, yeah, I would never paint. You have to apply. You have to practice. Yeah. You have to be willing to make it to realize it's not so precious, and to just get to work, you know, and and try it. But then there's also it's also good to have the foundation or it outline yeah. somewhat. But the outline, I mean, it, it's just or the rules or whatever eventually, you know, break them. <laughs> but yeah. I think being curious to me is the, has been my greatest teacher is my curiosity. Like I don't ever really paint. If I ever 
paint something because I think it would be a good painting or like, I mean, I shouldn't say that because things will be a good painting. I mean, I guess I subconsciously think that, but the main reason that something turns out to be an extraordinary painting that I do is because I was just so curious about like, hmm, I wonder if it starts with, I wonder, then it's probably going to be good because I'm engaged and I'm present. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if, or, huh, I wonder, I wonder, you know, like that's my, my big thing is wonder how I would do that or what color that is. You know, my obsession is color. <laughs> I just like, I think about, I, I am starting to consider the fact that I should think about, um, like uh composition <laughs> like some people are so like this is all composition which is so good but i'm realizing that i'm just obsessed with color <laughs> well well I, I so let's talk about the color you mentioned as a little girl yeah uh, being interested you seeing the vibrations of color the little dancing mm -hmm. uh dots of different colors yeah it reminded me of burge harrison he actually has a chapter yeah. in his book landscape painting called vibration and that's what it's about yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have to but, read that again. I have it. <laughs> yeah, I just I just did an audio book on it. I just recorded it. I just finished it. Ah, thank See, there's an audio book. That's good. That's what I I'm yeah. better at audio. It's interesting because I love books so much. Um, yeah. And then when I was little, I actually I opened a bookstore at the end of my driveway when I was like in second grade. I like made all these little books. But uh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> so you had a bookstore. In the you country. made your books. It, you, you weren't selling used, but you were making your own books. No, I made books with my friend Aaron. Oh. We were in second grade. <laughs> yeah, and we sold them. People would stop. They were like a quarter or something, and we would sell books. And so here you are, you're an author. Yeah, which is really interesting too, because I love books. And, you know, I, I am dis I'm dyslexic extremely and extremely meaning as a child, um, I was undiagnosed dyslexic. And right. yeah, so I really had a hard time reading, which is funny because I wanted to know the information and I wanted to hold the book. And I wanted to go to the library and I had books and I would draw in all my books, even though they weren't drawing books or like storybooks. But if I look through my books from when I was a child, everything that every name, phone number, everything was not just backwards, but flipped around like a, like a mirror from left to right. It went right from right to left, but then everyone was flipped around. And it was, I finally, I mean, I, figured out how to get through that undiagnosed until I was an adult. But so now <laughs> I, you know, I wrote a book, which really blows my mind because I definitely didn't think I would, but I think it's the, um, thinking about how much I liked books when I was a kid, but I couldn't really read them and retain the information. I think I loved the process of the, art like the pages yeah. and the creating and the, the whole process <laughs> you know this is astonishing see i did not know this about you and here you know i'm thinking about this book uh, mm -hmm. that you're writing that you have written and uh, getting ready to release before too long and yeah this just adds an additional dimension yeah to its value in my opinion yeah i mean people I've got students that I've, I've taught over a thousand students now, which blows my mind. And the only reason I know is because, in, yes, because in quick, and most of them are repeating for years, you know, but, but I've taught a lot of workshops and traveled sure. and taught and, you know, so it adds up and it's been 20, over 20 years of teaching, like 
full time. You know, I raised my children doing this and thinking about, you know, never did I ever dream I would write a book, but I was thinking about our interview this morning and just going, I, I had the memory of the bookstore that I had. <laughs> we would sell these little books at the end of the driveway. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Like all the things of childhood, like for me, like living my truth is like just what is true is what was what was meant to be and and how in a way life derails us from that. I don't know. It just fascinates me. But the but the students are the ones that have really encouraged me. And I think because of my learning disability, that's what it was called then, is and really all that is saying is my brain isn't like other brain, like the normal in the box brain. And I I would definitely agree with that. <laughs> so I think with that, you know, just knowing how hard it was for me to learn what other people would just learn. And I had to work so much harder to even remember the elements of creating a representational painting. I used to tape myself, you know, like with a recorder and put the tape in my car, like that, you know, the tape yeah. that was like this big. The little cassette so, tapes. Yeah. yeah, cassette tape. So I had a, a car, you know, that had a cassette tape holder or player. And to remember things I would read to myself and then I would just play it every time I went in the car to remember. And I think the book to me is, at first I thought I was doing it for my students because they were really encouraging me, like never shut up about when are you going to do this, like share this with people. Because the strategy that I've come up with to have people study and understand color and you know, it was kind of out of complete desperation to show them how I, what is going on in my brain, which I hadn't seen done. And I kept researching and researching and trying to find someone that wrote color down in a way that is, that you can understand it. And it's like tangible and you can, it's like a strategy because I need a strategy because my brain, I just can't read something and go, oh, I got it. And I thought, well, what if other artists are like this too? And we talk about color all the time, but there's not really a broken down. I have not seen a broken down strategy that makes sense to my brain. So, so and, is a, stra a strategy is kind of like a, having the Rand McNally Atlas next to you while you're traveling. Yeah. Well, another, another bad al analogy. I know. No, it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> or a map. <laughs> Well, map. it's visual, you know, it's a visual it a map. It is. Right. I mean, strategy makes sense to me and, and a map makes sense, like going here to here to here or an atlas, you know, it just, it does. But so, so my strategy is, is basic with starting with the primary colors of yellow, red, and blue. And some people don't, I mean, it sounds so basic, but some people really don't even know what a tertiary color is. So like, let's start basic as yellow, red, and blue is a primary. Secondaries are, you know, what a secondary is and then what a tertiary is and how the complication that I find with people is that everything in nature, to my eye, is tertiary. There are subtleties that are all tertiary and people can usually say, yeah, that's green or it's purple you know, or it's orange, they can kind of see that. But then when they go to neutralize or gray um, or dechromatize that color, things turn to mud and it gets kind of like flat. So there's not a relative vibration, which I saw right. when I was a child. So my strategy one time about 15 years ago, I was teaching, I go, okay, everybody it was a class. And I said, you're not putting the tertiaries in just use secondaries, make the secondary, get the value of the secondary, get the saturation of the secondary and get the temperature of the secondary compared to the one next to it. And we did that for a semester and just with the secondaries, the range that they were getting in the properties of color blew my mind. Nice. Because they were painting relativity and then they slowly started integrating the tertiary, which would be the third primary to neutralize your secondary. And that's what this book is about. And it gives you an exact 
strategy for that. Do you get resistance from that? Not one bit. Well, for one thing, I have a really trusting relationship with my students where I have, they, they know I have their best interest at heart and that I am, they trust me. So I think what happened is there was an engagement in their brains with their canvas and their colors that something they could focus on and it wasn't overwhelming, but their brains were becoming, were getting exercised. Um, like they hadn't before, because once you start getting overwhelmed and you just start grabbing, you know, you get overwhelmed and you kind of shut down the engagement. And I always say there's no room for guessing in color. I, I, I think they felt comfortable. And what was happening is their value structure, because to me, value is, it's a property of color and not separate. And it's very important in my opinion. So I don't separate that. Um, so they were now, so, I mean, I think it's challenging for some painters, even advanced painters. I mean, I get professional painters that I work with that need to work on different properties of color. And I think that we all can improve value. I mean, I'm Definitely. always working on improving value, right? I mean, that's, that's always what I'm, especially because I love color so much that I have to really like go, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Value, <laughs> you know, like, is it in right. light or dark? I feel that pain. I mean, I'm, I go through that too. And in fact, uh, my wife and I are getting ready to go to Colorado to visit mm. my daughter out there. And I thought about, she, my wife asked me, where are you going to take your paint stuff? And I said, no, nah, I'm not going to take very much. Mm. And I was going to take just a little paint box. Yeah. I was thinking yeah. I'm going to take white, black, and three ranges of gray. Oh yeah, and do that. Yeah, do value. And just do that to start with, you know, to to get a bit. I don't know. Is that a good strategy, or, or what do you think? You know, I have my students do. A, every single student has its requirement to do a nine point value scale, and it seems so simple. Like, but I had to redo mine for my book so that it was good because it's going to be printed. And I went, Jesus, it's hard. Like the better, <laughs> the harder it gets because you can see more. And just yeah. like really laying down. So, and then I have them do. Oftentimes I will just say, okay, I want you guys to do black and whites just, but we use white and black and make the values. So to me, I find it really important because it really strengthens your ability to gradate. Gradation is really important. Um, I think using black and white and making your values, I mean, and then well, that's if you even better, a, that's even better. I mean, yeah. to me, just bring black and white, you know, yeah. and, and do that. I think it's great because you can get yeah, in my book, I actually show I have a value chapter just to show the importance in the structure of value, you know, that color gets yeah, all the glory, yeah. value does all the work, that without the value, without who, the color. Who said that, by the way? I've been trying to track down the origin of that phrase. Do you know who who was? The I original? don't. Man, <sighs> maybe one of the listeners can tell us. I don't know. I've not been able to track it down. I don't know either. There's a few phrases, even... Um, it's public. It's 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 lore now. <laughs> yeah, I know. And what about you can't paint yourself out of drawing problem? Yeah. We're, who said that? That's another good one. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it just grew on the trees because to me, it seems like, well, duh. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but you can't, I like that one. You can't paint yourself out of a drawing problem, you know. <laughs> I've never been successful at it. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Just keep putting the paint on and then the problems will go away. So you've been teaching for quite some time. You've, you said mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier, thousand students. I think that's. I think that blows our mind. But you learn a lot about human nature in doing that. And you so, have, yeah. Yeah. Tell me about that. I mean, what? Because <laughs> I, I see you as a person, you're, you're probably looking at this and think, OK, how do I reach the hearts mm -hmm. and the minds so that they go from technical acumen to to really expressing themselves as artists. Mm, that's nice. Um, well, what, okay, so here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking right now, I just, for 20 years, I haven't taken a break from teaching except when I got sick <laughs> one time, um, like really sick. And so I had to, I was forced to, is my point. And, you know, basically even through writing the book and everything, I've been at least teaching online a little bit, but 
so I'm taking a break right now until the end of June from teaching for the first time to work on a show and just, you know, recover yeah. from the book and everything. And it's interesting because I feel a little unsettled about it, but knowing that I really need to do this, I think that teaching for me, there was a time when I thought, you know, my kids were little and I was, you know, they were four and five, I was newly divorced and I was like, how am I going to do this? And an artist. And so I started kind of teaching and it was a it, part of my income and definitely was super helpful, but it just organically kind of happened to like, people would say, can you teach me to paint? And then I started having classes, you know, and it just grew. And I didn't really have a style of teaching. I, it just, I grew with it. I was pretty much a kid myself and pretty much everyone I teach, I'm starting to catch up at 48, but like for a long time, most people were older than me that I taught, you know, now someone just asked me, they asked me why I teach. Is it, is it for financial? Is it, you know, why do you need to teach? Is that, so now my art is doing really well, meaning it could totally support me. My kids are now grown 21 and 23. I mean, it's just blows my mind, you know, but, you know, teaching to me, I think it's part of my calling. I think it's part of my art. I really care. I mean, I really have a curious, the strategy of trying to figure out how to reach each person individually, but also cohesively. So I'm really into structure and regimen showing up discipline. I'm a very disciplined person. Well, I make myself, I discipline myself, I should say. I don't even know if I'm <laughs> easy to do, to not. I mean, but I just don't give myself the option. Um, so when you say you're disciplined, are you talking about you set aside a time, a specific time, you go to work at that time? Yeah. Describe to me what discipline means to you. Well, considering, so everything for me is, it, it kind of changes um, with what's happening, but it's all about my my part, my art, my painting. So when I'm teaching, you know, I have a structure of a schedule and that's really helpful for me to have that, like, I have to show up, <laughs> like, no matter what, I have, I have to teach it. So I have this schedule like that. Um, painting is a discipline that I show up for right now, except today, because I'm doing the podcast with you. Um, I, you. you're thank you. I will be in my studio painting by eight. So 8 a.m. to noon for sure. I have to paint at least five days a week right now. And that's interesting because it's not super easy for me. I'm working for a show and usually I have an annual show because I paint, but right now I'm actually painting for a show, which I've never really done before. I mean, I've painted for museum oh. things and what, you know, like one yeah. piece for things. So it's a new kind of challenge. And I have been painting my way through writing this book, but the last two years has been very intense working with my editor, working with my designer, thinking I was done, feeling like a punching bag, <laughs> you know, like, oh, no. like literally, I'm not kidding. It was so, it, honestly, the editing process for me was torturous because I really thought it was done. And then I had to start you know, three different, you know, phases of editing, which I didn't know existed. So that was brutal. Yeah. So now I'm, I'm getting and that was, so I had a writing schedule writing, you know, you can be super productive or you can be there and just nothing can happen. It's really wild. So there could be times where, you know, you, you, you can't be productive on demand and something like that. Yeah. So that was, it, it gave me, I think empathy and more understanding for what it might be like for newer painters or students, because I really was trying to get the book done for years, just to have the book and have it be done. And I finally surrendered to the fact that this is a lifestyle and a process. And why would I think that writing a book would be different than painting and that it isn't about the destination, but it's about the journey. And I preach this and I think I needed this in some way 
to tap me down to where I needed to be again so that I would completely, completely understand on a deeply emotional level that, you know, this whole journey is about the process and writing a book as great as it looks. And, you know, all these, you know, videos and things that are being done and stuff on it. It was, there was a lesson for me in it. And it's about the process and being present. And so even when the process is difficult, where you hear things that you don't, maybe you don't want to hear them. It's still, yeah. there's still a satisfaction uh, yes. from doing that. Yes. Yes. It, it's like I, I, my editor, her name is Molly. <laughs> She's, I, we, we did the whole thing. She's in Boulder and I'm in Minnesota and we did the whole thing on zoom, but I, page by page, you went through it page by page together, or how does that process work? Oh, that's a crazy process. So developmental. So first of all, when COVID first happened, I was kind of, I had gone through, you know, some emotion, some personal loss, and I just was kind of a little stuck and all of a sudden the world shuts down. And, but I have really good friends and support that were encouraging me, you know, now it's the time to pick up your book again. Because I it was on pause for a little while from well, some... just, just a moment uh, with that. I want you to hold that thought there because you said you've been working on this book for a long time. So how long are we talking about? Over 10 years. Wow. 170 paintings and illustrations that I did myself. So what I did is I started documenting when I started. Um, actually, it was probably more than 10 years because when I first did this two color per average um, demonstration and it was working, I thought, uh oh, uh, what if I can't finish a painting like this? And here I'm teaching people. So I locked myself in my studio, told the kids you're having pizza the next three nights are excited. Yay! And, yeah. Pizza. <laughs> and I, I know they're like dominoes every night, you know, mom's painting. So I just grabbed random objects and I grabbed four oranges, a pitcher, a vase, red tablecloth, black background, like just stuff that I would never paint. And I thought, okay, let's apply this and use only the primaries. And I brought the painting to completion with this process. And the next day, two of my best collectors came in who buy landscapes. They were picking up a landscape painting. And they saw that on the, the still life on the easel. And they were like, we don't even like still lifes. Oh my gosh, you've never seen anything like this. And they bought the painting for, which is really cool. And that's the first painting that I started documenting for the exercise section of this. And that was like over 10 years ago. So there's some older stuff in there, but there's 170 paintings and illustrations explaining this. So see, that explains why it's a 10 year process because you're, yeah. you're meticulously and carefully considering each of these uh, fundamentals, these steps, uh, yes. and reproducing them, and that takes a great deal of time. That's a that's truly a labor of love. It truly is, and and I was also, I mean, like my son, he's twenty one the other day because you know the book launch, the pre sale started last week, and he's like, "You mean this has actually happened? You've been working on this my whole life," which is like. His I whole was 11 life. years old when you started. <laughs> He's like, never. All I say is, I have, I'm working on the book. He's like, you're never going to finish this. <laughs> you know? So that was a big thing. Now he's moving out. raising children myself, you know, mm -hmm. raising them with my art. I mean, so I had to teach and I had to paint and I had shows and, you know, I traveled. And so it wasn't just like I sat there for 10 years writing a book, but the process. And then when COVID happened, 
it was the manuscript was done, you know, and I just was like frozen. I didn't know what to do and the amount of money that it takes and I'm self-publishing and I really wanted to self-publish. I really wanted to do it myself. And then I thought, I don't know what to do. And, um, some people came up and, you know, Len, I, you know, borrowed me some funds to get an editor and, um, and a designer and a friend sent me a link to zoom, um, a Midwest independent publishers association cocktail hour. And she said, it's free for anyone. Go ahead and get on there today. They just did that because of COVID. So I get my glass of wine and I'm in my studio and there's all these like authors and publishers and, you know, people in the book industry, like that's their life, just like painting is mine. And I show up and literally we just went on the lockdown like two weeks before. And I'm like, well, I'm kind of a fish out of water here. I'm not an author. I'm a painter. And I just, I wrote a book. It's 200 pages and uh, I've been working on it 10 years and I have no idea what to do next. So then I meet these people and I get all these private messages from editors and designers. And there was one in particular that really stood out and he started the MIPA and I think was the president at the time. I think he might still be, but I might be getting that wrong, but Paul Nylander and he's a designer and he said, I'm really interested in, I I'm very fascinated with what you just said and what you're doing. I'm curious. So then I learned about different editors and I interviewed seven editors, finally came to Molly uh, McOwen. All right. Uh, okay. So I got, I got it. The reason I'm asking you these questions, Cami, is, I mean, I'm interested in your book. Okay. Yeah. But uh, in, I, I'll be transparent here too. Yeah, do it. <laughs> I, one of the things that, I'm really excited about is there's more and more art books being produced now. They seem like there was a dearth of them for, for, uh, you know, since the early two thousands, you know, Yeah. now there's, there's some good books coming out, but I don't yeah. know how this works. Oh, I didn't either. So you're, you're interviewing these editors. I mean, how do you do that? I, what are you looking for when you interview editors of a book, especially if you've oh. never done it before? Yeah, I actually didn't really know. I started doing a search on like Google, you know, or, yeah. you know, what to ask editors when you're writing a book. And so there's a lot of help sites and stuff, but yet that still wasn't as helpful as just learning by talking to them. I made a list of things that I knew I didn't know. And then I, then there was more things and pretty much was really honest. So I, I actually hired one locally from Minneapolis and I was really excited about her. I felt like I connected with her and she seemed excited. I needed someone that was excited about the project and that could help me to organize it. And then three days later, she emailed and backed out and said, this is bigger than I have time for. And I was pretty deflated. There was, there was a lot of incidents like that, things that I was really excited and then the course would change. So you know, I picked Molly because, you know, she was somewhat understood. I knew that this is a book about a new language, which is painting, you know, that most writers don't necessarily understand the language of painting, but her mom was a painter, is a painter. So she grew up in that. And I know from my own children growing up, being immersed in the life of a painter, you know, their mother, they can talk the language. They know the language because they've been immersed in it since childbirth. And I thought if this person had a mother, has a mother that's been painting her whole life, she knows things that other people that maybe even have been painters 10 years don't know. Well, and there's some empathy there too. Yep. And she was excited about it and she was very organized and, and she had structure. And so I hired her and then she read the manuscript. Um, I sent it off to her and that you do that, you transfer on something called WeTransfer. So I didn't know about that. And you can send large files and it was a large file. And she came back and said, okay. And you, she gives you a bid and then you're, you're like, oh. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then um, she says it needs to start with developmental editing and which I didn't know what that was. So developmental. Basically, so what is developmental editing? 
So that's developing, starting it all over. So she said, we're going to start with the table of contents, Mm. the TOC. And I'm like, okay, um, what? That's already done. Well, so it took a year to re... (laughs) So she sent me a list of questions. So it was really... um, I kept thinking, oh, I'll get it done this month. I had no idea that that would be a solid two-year project. And I mean solid. But why the table of contents? I never would have dreamed that that would be where, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how this yeah. thing works. So, yeah. and that's, that's your baby. <laughs> right. And, and again, it's like foundation, right? I mean, I'm like, what are you talking about? I mean, this is done. Like edit it. I was thinking like, you know, commas, apostrophes, you know, spelling, you know, like See, that's, that's what how I naive thought. I was. That's how yeah. naive I was. So, and, and then there was some like this kind of thing. And I started just kind of losing my own way a little bit too. And my mm-hmm. own, what I knew because I was starting to lean so much. And then I would go, wait, 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 this makes no sense anymore. So then I'd have to go, well, no, this doesn't make sense. So I would learn to be, to surrender because I, I was so such a fish out of water. I was so, it was all so new that I had no idea. And I thought I'm hiring her. I'm paying her. I have to trust her. And I started feeling like you just write it, but you can't do that. And then one day I just got like my grit back and I went, okay, no, I've got, this makes no sense. And I have to redo this. And then she went, okay. But there was a, there was a chapter that she, she really pushed hard on for me to have in there the first chapter. And I really pushed back and it was drawing and I wasn't going to do a drawing chapter because I'm like, this is a book on color. And she goes, well, go through a class with me. Tell me how the classes go. And so I said, you know, we do this scale and proportion angles, you know, and she said, so every time you do a class, you start with drawing. I'm like, so that Duh. was a whole, <laughs> so the first line in my after you learn how to use know how to use this book chapter and the key term definitions which is the first one that i did insist is like the first yeah. thing not the back you know not the index but like well you gotta term. know so you gotta know when to stand your ground a little bit because you know this this topic right. and they're right. guiding you and okay how do i best package this up right yeah So we started and it said, you know, the first line is, um, there's a, there's a saying in the painting world, you can't paint, paint yourself out of a drawing problem. And that is true. And so, so then that was a lot of work to do that chapter. So, so it was important though. And now it makes perfect sense. But I think what's hard is that I know this content so well, it is my life. It is everything is it's, I know it so well then to realize that someone is going to pick this up without me animating for one thing and talking about it and finding several ways to say the same thing until I reach someone, but it's in book form and that a lot of people have never met me that will be reading this and it needs to be clear. That was what she was, I mean, she was fantastic. Then once the developmental editing, editing gets done, then it goes to line editing. Okay. So then we have another like eight months. Eight and months. <laughs> yep. Wait, and I mean, so, hard so what is line editing? So then that is like, it goes, the manuscript goes back to her. But in the meantime, we had a lot of zoom meetings and then I would have a job to do and then come back to her. And I ultimately hired her to mentor me because I, I needed more than just shipping the manuscript back and forth and getting, you know, it lined up, but the line editing, then she goes through it again and she starts giving feedback. So she never in the comment field. So this was done in Microsoft word and there's comment fields and styles, style planes on the side. And so she would give comments to my writing and then I would have to decide what it should be. And then we'd go back to her again until finally we agreed and it was done and then it went to copy editing and that now is her job to clean up the writing but keep my writing in there my voice it's a big it's a big job first of all i wanted this to be the very best quality possible okay 
within my means. Yes. Um, and that's why this has been such a big project. There are a lot of people writing books and there's a lot of printing on demand now. And you yeah, don't want to blurb or uh, yep. create space in places like that. Mm -hmm. I did not want to do that. Okay. I want mm -hmm. offset printing the book, the quality, everything about the book is going to be absolutely beautiful from cover to dust jacket, to pages, to, you know, everything design, editing content. So that's important to me. And what I've learned is that you can quickly get a book done these days and everyone can say they wrote a book <laughs> and and that's maybe true but that they don't necessarily always get an editor when they're self-publishing so self-publishing they're called indie publishers independent publishers i've learned that too i didn't know what that was but it can be looked down upon if you don't have a publisher and part of the reason that that is so is because a lot of times the quality isn't, it might be great content, they might have good in, con, intent, um, but that without a designer and an editor, I mean, if right. you're not an editor and you're not a designer, no matter how good of a writer you are, there's, you're miss, it's missing something, it definitely is. And when you have a publisher, you have editors doing this for you and you have designers doing this for you and you turn your manuscript in like I, did a few years ago and then had to keep working on it and they would do that for you or they'd come back with the feedback but they'd be kind of carrying that structure so i was the publisher i'm the boss <laughs> which is kind of scary when you don't know what you're doing <laughs> so i learned as i went but in the process i opened a publishing company and it made sense to call it the St. Croix River School of Painting Publishing Company because that's the school that I founded. Now, and is that your intent to not just publish your book, but perhaps other media and books? <laughs> well, like my designer said, now that you know how to do this, you're probably going to do more. And I said, not with words. <laughs> 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 I might make more books, but not with words. If I had known it was going to be this hard, I would have never done it. <laughs> I thank God every day for what I didn't know. I'm serious. <laughs> See, that's what happens when you have, as you mentioned, curiosity. Yes, yes. <laughs> you got so curious and you wanted to do it. So you got in there. I am so grateful for what I did not know because so my book is 200 pages approximately because it's almost done getting designed. It's got approximately 170 images and 28,000 words. And that you're very intimately familiar with after mm -hmm. this editorial process. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So, and the designer is a big part of a book like this because it's a visual book and he's awesome. So he's really, really good and very excited about the project too, which is cool. So, I mean, I think, you know, you can do all this print on demand stuff and, and it's fine. It's a good way to get started. But for me, and against a lot of people's um, advice, the, the pros, I just really had an idea of how I wanted to do this. And, you know, I hope it works. Well, I look forward to seeing the book. I don't think I actually mentioned the title of the book. Uh, it's called Color Relativity, Creating the Illusion of Light with Paint. So there's a nice uh, video trailer that you had filmed um, that gives insight into your thought processes and the reasons for the book. Can't wait to read it. This is yeah. be great. I can't wait to touch it and hold it and just like, I just can't wait to touch it. I can't wait to take the first copy out of the box. I'm just... That's exciting. That's exciting. It is exciting. It's really, and, and I really, what's so cool is I, I believe, and this isn't just a, I really believe that this is going to really help painters. I, and it's a beautiful book too. The cover is beautiful. And there's a lot of my full paintings in the back in the gallery section. So collectors can really enjoy the book too. And it's really a book on how to see color. And I love when my students say that their spouses now see color differently and they can enjoy a gray day like they didn't before, just because they're teaching them how to see color. You know, that's right in front of them. What color are the clouds? <laughs> Every color. <laughs> yeah. Yellow, yep. blue, gray. 
I yep, love, all the yeah. colors, all the colors. Wow. Yeah. And that film was neat too. I mean, that kind of happened. A filmmaker, John Call, asked how he could, I was in a documentary on the St. Croix River for the 50 year anniversary of the Clean Water Act that Walter Mondale put in place a few years ago. And he said, how can I help you with this book? And I said, actually, in my research, I found that to do a pre-sale, I need a two-minute film um, to describe the book. Well, in the process of this creating this two-minute film, the two-minute film is a three-minute film. And, the, um, and then he made what he's calling a mini doc, so a mini documentary, because he got so into the project. And then we needed music. And I said, I really want box sweet cello um, prelude number one. Probably said that out of order, but I want a cellist. And he said, that's going to be really expensive. We had like zero budget and he's doing this for a painting. So, I mean, it's not like, you know, so it's all trading. And so then I said, well, don't we know a cellist? There's got to be a cellist. There's someone that plays the cello. And then he said, well, because he was a lobbyist back in his working days and and he said, I, I, I'm a, I've, an acquaintance with Janet Horvath, and she's the former, former principal cellist of the Minnesota Orchestra. So she's like phenomenal. Wow. And okay, there I'm you like, got oh, that. You yep. can ask. So then she's like, I'd love to help a Minnesota impressionist. And, you know, and she's really supportive of women in the arts and all that. And then, then I use the, um, in the film, I use the analogy of keys on the piano or like similar to painting and she, he goes, now we need a pianist. And then we got Jan, or um, Heather McLaughlin. It was just great. And then we got Tom Forletti, who's a sound engineer. And all these people just wanted to help, you know, launch an art project. This is all available on, you have a special website just for the book. And it's called? Co colorrelativity.com. Okay. And we'll have a, a link oh, in the show great. notes so that people can, can yeah. find that. Yeah. yeah. And when does it come out? So it's expected to be here by the end of summer. And at one time it was going to be June and the state of the world right now is really the reason there's yeah. a delay. Yeah. It's I'm, I'm on the list to be, I, we've got the printer selected and all of that done and the pre-sales are important. Um, this is, this is a book of, you know, it's, it's not necessarily going to be profitable. I just would love to get my costs covered. <laughs> Um, it's very expensive and to do. Um, so the pre-sales will help to pay for the printing. So are you doing direct uh, pre-sales or are you doing something like Indiegogo or something like that? I am doing it direct because I learned through my research that there's a percentage you give for these other things and I've got a pretty good following. Um, so I started a new website. It's I will have a fulfillment center that's called Itasca Books and they're in Minneapolis. So when the books come, they will the, the pallets of books will go right to Itasca and then they'll do my fulfillment. So they'll ship for me. So I'm linked to them. Um, so if you're within the United States, it's best to order right from colorrelativity.com. But if you're outside of the US, you can order, you can pre-order from itascabooks.com. And um, if you're outside of the US, shipping is not free. But if you are within the pre-order gift, I am paying for the shipping for everyone um, by pre-ordering. Very good. Cami. we didn't even get into your art, I at least know. not very much of it. But we'll there's always, we can always do a part two in the near again. future. We'll do, yeah, let's do this one more time. Do it again. Yeah, okay. it'd be fun to talk about the paintings. I do want to talk about the paintings. I got... <laughs> <laughs> is... But I think this is enough for... Part yeah, one. we don't okay. want to overload them. <laughs> yeah, so let's do part one. Okay, uh, part one. All right. So I'll, I'm going to have you back because we did not talk about your paintings, but I, I thought it was very important to talk about the book because yeah. I know there's people, I've had people ask me about it and I know nothing about it. So I think it was important topic to talk about. And I really appreciate you sharing the... Um, Oh, I'm going to use a cliche, the agony and the ecstasy. <laughs> yes, there's a reason for these cliches. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. You know, uh, I think it was James Reynolds 
the artist James Reynolds that worked on that movie, The Agony and the Ecstasy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> that was fresh. I was just reading his book. I've just got his book, uh, The Landscape Paintings of James Reynolds. And I don't have that them. book. I love books. I love, I love your library, just the look of the library behind you. Well, somebody asked me, have you read all those books? <laughs> it's like, um, I just like, pull yeah, them down just and look at them. it. Yeah. I have a big library in here, and then I have a large library in my house, too. And I just, my dream was always just to have books and art. And now you've got your bookstore. You got a bookstore after all these years. So that's a cool. real bookstore. Isn't that wild? One last piece of information. Um, yeah. Now we've got the book place, but what about your website for your art? Yeah. So my main website is www.camimendelik.com. And that is where my classes, I've got workshops this summer in Bayfield and Vermont here, um, Red Wing. And then that's where all my paintings are. You can see that and you can read my bio there. The color, and they're both linked to one another, but the color relativity is because of the e-commerce needs, they needed me to connect to the fulfillment right. center there. So I'm learning a lot. <laughs> that's what we want to do as artists, right? Never stop learning. Yeah, yep. It's the journey, not the destination. It's for the process, you know, for the love of doing it. Surrender to the process, right? One painting at a time. Surrender to the process. Yeah. I think I just got the show title for your show. Surrender to the process. I like yeah. that. That's what I'm going to yeah. use. Well, anyway, Cami, I will have you back for part two, and then we'll focus in on your art. Your art is quite beautiful, and I'd like to really understand um, that what you do in your art making there. So, Thank but, you. I would love to share that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being on The Artful Painter today. This has been fun. I'm grateful. Yeah, it's really fun. Fun to connect and talk, and you have a great voice. Well, thank you. I truly appreciate Cami Menlet taking the time to talk with me in this episode. The way this conversation turned out is the very reason I do not script out questions in advance. Uh, we went down a direction that I would have never have dreamed. I was not anticipating Cami talking about the challenges of dyslexia. I really appreciate her candor and honesty on this, and also appreciate her determination. Uh, reading books, her love of books, and then uh, writing a book, a 10 year plus project. And I'm sure it's an amazing work. Be sure to check it out. Color Relativity, Creating the Illusion of Light with Paint. Now, this episode right here is the last one for the next few months. The reason is, is my wife and I are in the process of moving to Colorado. Part of that move involves some renovation work on our new home, as well as creating a new studio for the Artful Painter. I am really excited about that. This studio here, it has served me well. It's been my home office for the last nearly 40 years. This has been my office. So, yeah, I will miss it a little bit, but not much because I'm moving into a much bigger space uh, where I have more room uh, to paint, uh, to record the podcast, perhaps even have guests live in the studio. So I'm looking forward to that. But I appreciate your patience because uh, it is going to take some time to do it. This is not the end of The Artful Painter. Rather, it's just a pause. It's like your favorite television show, right? They have seasons. So here, here we are. We're at the end of this one. And in a few months, we'll be back with a brand new episode. And most likely, that first episode or very close to it will be a follow-up conversation with Cami because in this conversation, never really got around to talking about her actual art. And I want to do that. Her paintings are magnificent. And so I want to be able to talk about that, what she thinks about, how she chooses her subjects, the why. I want to get into the why of her painting. So uh, we'll do that. We'll do a part two with Cami. And of course, there's other conversations I, I like to have as well. 
So again, this is not goodbye. This is the last recording I'm doing in this studio. It's bittersweet because this studio has been my home. It's been my professional home for nearly 40 years. For nearly 40 years, this is where I've worked. This is where I've interacted with clients. This is where I've recorded my podcasts. And this is where I've made my art. This has been my home for a long time. So, uh, you know, I'm excited about moving to Colorado, but I'm also bittersweet about leaving behind the place where many of our memories were made. In fact, in this home, uh, my wife and I, we've pretty much lived our entire adult life in. So uh, there's a lot of memories here and we'll miss that. But uh, it's time to move on and we look forward to creating new memories in the beautiful state of Colorado. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of The Artful Painter. Remember, it is coming back, okay? Perhaps late this fall, it is coming back. May your tubes all be full of beautiful and light, fast colors and your brush strokes made with confidence. I'll see you all in the next edition of The Artful Painter.